Good evening. Welcome to the Livingston County Board of Commissioners meeting. It's six o'clock on my computer. I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order. It's October uh, 24th of 2022. Um, we'll start off with a moment of silent reflection. Thank you. Um, now, if you would uh, join us in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, Madam Clerk, roll, roll call, please. Commissioner Nakagiri. Here. Commissioner Griffith. Here. Commissioner Smith. Here. Commissioner Reeder. Here. Commissioner Helzerman. Uh, here. Commissioner Drick. Here. Commissioner Zajac is absent. Commissioner Gross. Here. Commissioner Plank. Here. A quorum is present. Um, next up is correspondence. We have no correspondence uh, this evening, so we'll move on to item number six, which is call to public. Every citizen, whether here in the room or on Zoom, has the opportunity to address the board for three minutes. I will set a timer, which uh, will beep at the end of three minutes. Uh, prior to the, um, the beep going off, I'll say, um, I'll verbally say you have about 15 seconds. So I'll, um, so if you wanted to uh, here in the room address the Board of Commissioners, um, you should have filled out a card. So I'd ask the clerk. Uh, if we have anybody. I do. Stacy Farrell. Yeah. Farrell. Sh sure. Yes. <clears throat> I'm here to ask for my nomination for the volunteer citizen position to the HSCB board be reconsidered. I thought it might be helpful for me to come tonight and to talk about my experience and how it fits with the HSCB mission. I have a bachelor's degree in business administration and my professional experience is in sales and program management. After the birth of my, my youngest child, he became very ill. And where we lived at the time in rural Wexford County, he was in and out of the local ER, urgent cares, and various pediatricians and an internist. It was still unable to be diagnosed. His condition became so dire that while we were sent to the emergency room four hours away down here to U of M Mott Children's Hospital where my son was diagnosed with a rare vascular disorder and spent the next 21 days in the pediatric intensive care unit. He was 15 months old. After we were stabilized, we were sent back up north with medical equipment and a strict schedule of five different medications that were specially compounded that were dosed out at four different times per day, including one in the middle of the night. One night when I was using the dosing syringe, I dropped the bottle, the glass bottle, and it shattered. That's when I found out that my son's life-saving medication couldn't be duplicated at a regular pharmacy. This is what's called a gap in the system. That is one of many gaps I experienced that caused me to start advocating for services for my child, first locally with the health department, then regionally with the hospital system, and then to Lansing with the children's special health care program. That's where I was appointed to the Family Leadership Network. The network was created out of the common need to obtain diverse perspectives from families and receive input on programs and special projects. Family perspectives are highly valued and contribute to a better understanding of experiences with healthcare and other systems in Michigan. The primary role is to offer support, information, connection, and connection to community-based resources to family of children with special healthcare needs. I am also a Leadership Livingston graduate, um, a program that I know Mr. Zajac is an alum, and I have a letter of recommendation from that program, which is facilitated by Deborah Dirk. According to the mission statement of the HSCB, it's to ensure a system of support for members of our community. Their belief statements include that the collaboration requires broad community representation and that community members needing services should receive them as efficiently and effectively as possible. And I believe that is accomplished in part by identifying gaps, gaps that can be seen by those who have experienced the systems. My experience across two regions in this state, regions two and in region nine, give me a unique perspective of a system of care across many communities. And that is in part why I believe it makes me a great addition to this board. And I kindly ask for your reconsideration. Thank you. Thank you. 
Doug Helzerman. Uh, I can do it from over here. I will. Uh, this is about proposal three. Commissioner, we cannot hear you on Zoom. Thank you. Can you hear me now? I can. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, proposal three, uh, I'd like to take it from a different uh, perspective, two historical realities that uh, impact on this uh, proposal. First, uh, the, the generational uh, slavery of people of African descent is a sin that we're still paying for. Those who profited from that evil system justified it in part by denying the full humanity of those enslaved. The treatment of the slaves showed that they were considered like animals that could be owned. Secondly, Michigan was the first state uh, to outlaw capital punishment. They rejected the idea that the government had power to sanction the death of another human being, even for the most egregious murders, murderers or rapists. Michigan has historically protected all life, innocent human babies in the body of the mother, and even convicted murderers. These two historical facts should give us direction for our consideration of Proposal 3. The mistake of taking away the humanity of any human allows the imaginable evil of unjustified suffering and death. If the unborn is a separate human being that uh, with its own standing, the answer is very clear. If on the other hand, the developing life is somewhat less than human, the human mother may be right to remove the unwelcome presence in her body. Considering the rules of justice and the principles of the rule of the law, uh, the state cannot allow the sanctioning of death without due process. The rights of one human, the mother, must be considered in the light of the rights of the two other human beings, the biological father, and the separate human life being formed inside of the mother. If a capital sentence, a government-sanctioned death, becomes accepted, the principles that allow it can be extended and be applied to other innocent life. There are several... Um, uh, statements I'd like to read. A premeditated end of someone's life is generally called first degree murder. You have 10 seconds. Okay. Hanging a person without a formal trial is called lynching. Conviction without due process is called a kangaroo court. court. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Randy Clausen. I'm Randy Clausen. I'm from Howe, Michigan, and you all have heard me talk before, so you probably know my story. I'm about transportation, and I, I am very um, concerned that we have a adequate public transportation, including weekends. And I'm here to say how happy I am that there's been some improvement on that line, and now we have a bus running on Sunday. In fact, Sunday was very special at our church because Eric Casey, who has been been, been transported by another couple of from our church to our church, he had some unfortunate medical setbacks. And so he wasn't able then to transfer himself. So they weren't able to take him. But after a couple of weeks of getting or getting scheduled, he was at church on Sunday and we were all very pleased to have his attendance. And so um, the adequate public transportation is in all of your hands because you hold the purse strings and we know that for every dollar you donate donate or every dollar you approve uh, it's worth over six dollars from the federal and Michigan taxes that are ours for the taking if we just get enough of your funds to counteract that so that's that one of the asks that I would ask you to do that. And I do wanna say thank you to those of you who were part of the, the League of Women Voters 
uh, candidate forms because you even mentioned, some of you even mentioned transportation and that was uh, encouraging to me to, to know that it was in your heart and mind even when you're being um, at, at a candidate forum. So uh, I appreciate you. Appreciate your time and and we are doing uh, as much as we can for transportation and we are so glad that so many of the uh, county commissioners are starting to see the importance of that and we know that in this kind of economy where people are needing to get to and from work, a better bus system, more adequate and weekends will help the economy overall so thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Connie Robinson. Good evening. Recently, I became aware through public records that Matt Bolang requested a Democrat ballot for the 2020 presidential primary. Data from the 2020 presidential primary shows there were approximately 162,000 registered voters in Livingston County. 27,458 voters requested a Democrat ballot. Therefore, only 16.9% of Livingston County registered voters voted for a Democrat candidate. It follows that 83.1% of registered voters either did not vote or voted for the Republican candidate. Of the 27,458 Democrat voters, 87.51% voted for either Joe Biden or Bernie Sanders. Public records show that no other Livingston County elected official voted for a Democrat in the 2020 presidential primary. Again, Bolang was among the 16.9% of Democrat voters which places him in an extreme minority of Livingston County voters. A casual voter with middle of the road views does not take time to vote in a presidential primary. Therefore, I think it's fair to say that Bolang has strong views which lean to the left. It is disturbing to me to think that Bolang chose to vote for the party of open borders, to fund the police, inflation, critical race theory, et cetera. But the most egregious of all, is that Bolang chose to vote for the party that celebrates abortion and promotes trans transgender ideology. He could have chosen to vote for the most pro-life president in our lifetime, but he chose otherwise. With this knowledge, one has to wonder what would happen in different case scenarios. For example, if a 15-year-old boy comes to the health department and asks for puberty blockers, will he be referred to a therapist or will he be referred to Planned Parenthood? Or will he be given the drugs? If a 16-year-old girl comes to the health department asking for an abortion, will she be referred to the pregnancy health clinic or will she be referred to Planned Parenthood? Last week, a CDC panel voted to add the COVID vaccine to the recommended childhood immunization schedule. It now goes before the CDC director in the US Department of Health and Human Services where it will almost certainly pass. We already know that Matt Bolang rubber stamps the health department's useless masking re recommendations. It's naive to think he wouldn't do the same for the recommendation of the COVID vaccine into the childhood immunization schedule. I don't know how the commission could impede the distribution of the COVID vaccine at the health department, and you may not know either. However, if there is way, a way, perhaps through funding, to stop the vaccine in the county, such a policy would be much easier to implement if we have yeah, a health officer seconds. that shares the views of the majority of the county. And last, I think this new information, I, I, I'm hoping this new information um, will, with it, you will reassess your position on Matt Bowling and uphold your duty to do so. Thank you so much. Thank you. I have no more cards. So we'll look on uh, Zoom here and uh, look for some raised hands and I'm not seeing any. So I'm going to go ahead and cl close the call to public and remind um, both citizens here in the room and on Zoom, there's a second call to public at the end of the meeting, um, albeit that is for two minutes, not three. Um, next up, item number seven is approval of minutes. We have meeting minutes dated October 11th, 2022. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes? So move, Gross. 
Support, Helzerman. Motion by Commissioner Gross, support by Commissioner Helzerman. Are there any additions or any corrections to the minutes? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The uh, minutes are approved. Um, item eight, we have no tabled items from previous meetings, so we'll move on to item nine, which is approval of tonight's agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved, Griffith. Support, Plank. <coughs> Motion by Commissioner Griffith, support by Commissioner Plank. Uh, any discussion? And all those in favor of approving the agenda signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Oh, we have an agenda. Um, item number 10, our reports. Um, this evening we have a report from uh, EDC, um, Marsha Gabarowski. Um, is going to uh, give us an update on uh, EDC. Give it a minute for the presentation to come up. So good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for allowing me to have a few minutes to do a, a biannual uh, report to uh, the commission. Uh, again, my name is Marcia Gabarowski. I'm the director of business development here in Livingston County. I work for Ann Arbor Spark, and I work on behalf of the Economic Development Council of Livingston County. Uh, and so a quick recap, the EDC is a, um, we are a public private nonprofit organization. Uh, it was formed in 1984. Uh, currently there is a board, they meet uh, quarterly of 24 board members. Um, this year we have 10 public sector partners and 25 private sector partners. And our total budget is uh, around $380,000. Uh, and I wanted to share, a, um, the board had updated their mission statement and their bylaws a couple years ago. And it kind of gives you a good recap of what uh, the goal of the board uh, has been for the past few years. And it says the EDC is committed to strengthening the economic base for Livingston County through retention, expansion, attraction, and development of jobs and capital investment. The EDC works closely with private and public entities to facilitate community and economic development activities, strategic initiatives, and regional, national, and international collaborations to the benefit of all Livingston County communities. So that is, that is what I set up my work plan to do uh, on a regular basis and for the last five and a half years as my role as Director of Business Development. Next slide. So a quick um, snapshot of some of those core metrics. What do I do? I, I um, and in meeting with our businesses and looking to support new capital investment in Livingston County. Uh, so far this year, uh, we have uh, benefited and worked to achieve $12.5 million of new capital investment. Uh, and that has created um, 84 new job commitments of Livingston businesses. Uh, we have, and I say we, because uh, there's myself and two others uh, that do work here in Livingston County, but we have um, sat down and we've had conversation and retention visits with over 60 businesses, and that represents a little over 2,100 employees in the county. Uh, and through those visits and those retention visits, uh, we've made over 30 referrals for new resources, whether that's a new program at the state whether that's a connection with our Michigan Works and our workforce development partners, um, but those are, that's, that's the conduit. We're the conduit of resources to make sure that Livingston businesses are able to succeed. Um, oh, real quick, so in addition to working with our existing businesses, we do spend time on the attraction side. And we do have a pipeline of about 34 projects where we have um, said, you know, there's a property in Livingston County or there's a building in Livingston County that's properly zoned, has the utilities, and it might be a fit for that project. Uh, not all of these projects transpire. Otherwise, there'd be 15 projects for one, one, one piece of property on Latson Road. Um, but should the, the, um, the cumulative um, investment, should those 34 projects land in Livingston County would be um, over $27 million and over 300 potential jobs. So what does that tell us? There's always eyes in Livingston County uh, and we do have some property and we do have um, a lot of interest 
um, within the region and certainly have um, the opportunities uh, for the right project to land in Livingston County. So we do spend some time on that. Um, part of the metrics, a portion of that 12 and a half million investment, one success story, uh, Pop Daddy Popcorn continues to expand. Uh, and they recently moved from Green Oak Township into Genoa. They purchased a building, almost quadrupled their size. Uh, but we referred them for some additional grant funds through the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development so that they could continue to expand their production or um, improve production processes of their um, popcorn and pretzel products. So it's great to see them continue to expand. Uh, and they're expecting over the next three years to um, more than double their um, employment. So that's the addition of a little over 50 jobs. So a lot of excitement um, with some of our smaller companies that we love to see grow. Uh, next page. We put out a quarterly report, they're available on our website and one will be emailed probably this week to everybody, but we do a dashboard. And again, Spark uses data when we are looking to try to tell the story of Livingston County and to share information with our stakeholders. Um, in Q3, this was just um, put out. We kind of see some trends going down, unemployment down. Uh, Livingston wages slightly went down compared to the state's average wage. Uh, again, census really isn't as up-to-date as we would like. So this is from Q1 and we're already in Q3. Uh, labor force participation trended down in Livingston. Manufacturing employment went up. So we have had an uptick of manufacturing job postings uh, with our local employers. But overall job postings down and home sales trending down. So uh, again, this is stuff that we make sure that we check every quarter. And uh, because again, it, it kind of sets the table of, are we seeing a new trend uh, or is there another area that we would want to pay more attention to um, on behalf of our stakeholders? Next slide. One strategic initiative that we took on um, in 2022 uh, was to do a benchmarking report. Um, in Washtenaw County, this is done annually. We have done this internally in 2018 with one of my former colleagues, Julia Upfall. We partnered with the University of Michigan and they did a similar comparison where Livingston was compared to relatively sized counties across the state. So the nine other counties in the state and then other counties across the nation that were similar in, in, in size and population to Livingston. Uh, the full report, I think there were over 25 bench, bench metrics that, were, that we benchmarked ourselves against. But if you go to the next page, and there were just a couple that kind of give you a visual of what this looks like. So on housing affordability, uh, certainly Livingston um, came in at the third highest compared to our, our sister counties in Michigan. Uh, but we were pretty much in the middle of the pack and somewhat on the lesser expensive side when it comes to national a national um, benchmark. So what that tells us is we're pretty still, we're, we're very competitive still at a national level. So when we're looking and we're talking to businesses at a national scope, Michigan in, in, our, in the Ann Arbor and Livingston region is still pretty competitive. And, um, you know, we can still talk about that good quality of life. And that includes um, a more affordable housing environment. The next slide. So another benchmark we did was commercial property listings. And Livingston is not the biggest county of all of the other counties that we benchmarked ourselves against. So certainly we did come in at the lowest of commercial listings. Uh, that's not a surprise. That was not a surprise to us. But what that does tell us is we are more selective when we look at these attraction opportunities. Uh, and if it's not a fit, we just simply say it's not a fit. We probably don't have the building stock. Uh, we are still a, an advocate of uh, when it makes sense, if there, is, if there is that project that could fit or if we can put resources into a building rehab, we certainly will. Um, but this is just a, a visual of what the full report looks like on so many other metrics. And again, it's on our website and we can get copies of the benchmark study to everybody. Marshall, I think you already had it. I have mm -hmm. a question if I could. Yeah. Um, if this is, a, this is a number, right? Uh, it's a number. As opposed to a percentage or say, say, if you would show Livingston County how many we fell 
compared to how many we have available, Livingston County might come out more favorable. Is that a possibility if we, um, because if we don't have- That's a possibility. You know, so we may be doing a very good job in comparison. Yes. It just, we're doing as good as we can, or yes. you know, that may be a- it does, There are two sides to the story. We're very good at keeping our buildings occupied. Okay. And, um, and, and, but this was just the, the commercial property listings. Okay, so, mm -hmm. you know, whether you, whether you can next time make it make Livingston County look a little bit better, you know? Well, actually, we, we do <laughs> say that it is, it is actually a very good spin when sure. the commercial properties are, um, the tenants are very long-term in right. those sites. Right, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Next slide. So another strategic project that we completed, and it's another uh, big part of my work plan, is working with our schools and our K-12 students. Um, on October 6th, it was the day before National Manufacturing Day, but we did hold National Manufacturing Day uh, through a collaborative that I convened with our local manufacturers, uh, as well as uh, LESA and the CTE program. So we had six employers, uh, Thai Summit, TG Fluids, Aludine, Promess, Hatch Stamping, and Chemcrest. Uh, and they hosted just over 100 CTE students. Uh, each class went on two field trips. And I think that was about eight classes total. Uh, what I love about this is a small grant that we administer was used to cover all the costs. So we planned it for the teachers. We made sure the busing was there. Students had a great lunch and they, we just helped make it a great day. So that's always a fun thing. Uh, this week is what is called job shadow week. Uh, and so another way that we make sure employers know if they wanna plug into um, having FaceTime with our students, because that is probably increasingly the top three things that I hear. How do I get in front of students? How do I get in front of the middle schoolers? How do I get in front of the CT classes? And so we, we make sure that these events are, um, are well, well done, and uh, LESA is a phenomenal partner to work with in that regard. Next slide. So I don't have my colleague, Nick Jablonski with me. He is uh, my partner here in Livingston County. So Nick's chair, sorry, he was sick. Part of his um, time at Spark is managing the STEM Forward grant. And this is um, pretty prominent. Um, Spark does administer it, it is statewide. But if you go to the next slide, we have been able to give Livingston businesses a big advantage because we're here and we're talking about it so much. Uh, Spark received funds from the state uh, and businesses that have an internship that is STEM related in any way, shape or form, we're able to pay half of those wages for that intern. These are college interns. So we are uh, really making that push to support businesses that have those college internships uh, and trying to make it as easy as possible for businesses to um, create those opportunities for, for college interns uh, to have work experience in any kind of STEM role. Uh, so we have had um, a number of Livingston businesses take advantage of this program with a lot of success. So we have promoted it greatly with Cleary and, uh, but, this was Nick's um, portion and we still wanted to, to put the numbers up there because we just, uh, this program has been going, oh, I hope I did this right for him, eight or nine months and we've exceeded 500 interns. And again, this is statewide. And, um, but again, we're here and it's something that we're constantly um, making sure that our companies know is available. Next slide. Uh, so we do have uh, an event in a couple of weeks. It is the annual meeting of the EDC LC. And the last couple of years, we have made it um, a, bit, a bit of a celebration. It allows uh, the EDC to um, bring uh, the business community together. Uh, we're going on another, um, last year we did a panel discussion. We're gonna do another panel discussion about the, um, status of the workplace, so the culture of the workplace today uh, as the pandemic uh, is ending and what are some of these best practices and what does the workplace actually look like? Uh, so um, our own Nathan Bird is one of the panelists. Uh, we will, as we did last year, we will be doing awards. So there will be um, a business for the Resilience Award, Project of the Year, and Talent Innovator. 
So um, all are welcome and we look forward to uh, another great night of networking and um, updates from Spark staff and EDC. And then finally, this is just a, a quick overview of the Livingston team. So Nick is uh, in the middle, so he's sorry he couldn't be here. Uh, Phil Santer is still a uh, senior vice president of the business development team. Uh, so he does spend some time in Livingston, but shares his time as chief of staff and in Washtenaw County. Uh, in 2020, I hired Denise Murray on a special contract with the city of Brighton and their downtown development authority. So she has been on the team and has been doing a great job working with our main street businesses, our small retailers, uh, and has been sharing best practices on how we can implement um, new ideas and thought processes when we work with our larger businesses. And then Tammy Salisbury is our development coordinator. And a few years ago, uh, the EDC did uh, make the decision to bring on um, additional development efforts uh, to continue to keep the budget healthy and that it wasn't fallen on the board to do the fundraising. And so Tammy uh, is on contract under Spark to do that. And she focuses solely on Livingston County. And it's been a great Great having her here. So that is a little bit of a recap on what we have been doing here in the county. And I'm happy to take any questions. Questions from commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Smith. Thank you. Nice presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question as to your, your perspective on why there are, uh, I'll say, fewer developments in the Michigan County. Fewer developments. So would it be regulatory hurdles? Mm -hmm. Would it be available land, which I doubt? Would it be township zoning? Would it be all the above? From my perspective, there are, there are a few things that we might be able to have some control over and some that we can't. A lot of the projects today um, do need in excess of 300 acres. We don't have those mega sites. Uh, we do have them. They're just not zoned properly. So if we were to look at, you know, a map of the county, it's just it's just not in our, our wheelhouse until uh, communities look at future land use uh, and rezone something for a, a large opportunity. That's that's one area we just we get looked over because we don't have that what we call a mega site. We have a sweet spot of anything between 50 and 200 acres. That is where we shine because we do have a good selection of land that size. So that's where we, you know. Last year, I think our our attraction pipeline was double the amount than the 34 that we have right now, just because that was where the projects were coming in at. Um, but it is the, the, the mega sites is what most of the projects are looking for at an attraction level. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to the sites that we currently have, um, it, it's, it's access to utilities. You know, we are still a rural community and the access to um, more water and more power uh, does add cost. And it really does take someone that's invested in a piece of property to say, okay, what's, let's build this out. Let's build out the performa. What are these costs going to be? And, um, and to have a, you know, a bit of a commitment to making that a go. Is there coordination between uh, your office and uh, the county planning department or certain township planning departments that? Yes. Yep. Um, actually, I was just in touch with Handy Township Zoning <laughs> Director today because um, a few other properties came into my wheelhouse that I knew nothing about. And so, yes, I do um, have frequent touches with Kathleen's team and um, Nick meets um, monthly with the city of Howell, Denise in Brighton. Uh, there are a lot of initiatives in what we call the site readiness world. Uh, so these sites that are, are, are good, but could be better if we had better utilities or, um, or, or something. There, there's just maybe a hurdle. Uh, and so the state is announcing a lot of funding that could actually um, come into these communities and for these sites to make them that much more ready for development. We are also, we have a lot of wetlands. And so even just a little bit of wetlands takes properties out of contention pretty quickly as well. In your comment on 
rural county and uh, infrastructure are you including the issue of broadband in that infrastructure that label so that isn't something that comes at us on a short list for a business uh, but certainly when I look holistically as a county, broadband is needed for there to be additional neighborhood development to develop our communities so that the businesses do see that they have that local workforce. So they do go hand in hand. Thank you. Anybody else? Commissioner Hauserman. Uh, yes, uh, there was a... Uh, asphalt company that wanted to locate several places in Livingston County. Uh, what uh, was, did Spark have any uh, involvement in that? Could you talk about that? So Capital Asphalt did reach out to Spark for, um, you know, what sites in Livingston County. And they were pretty specific. They really wanted to be close to where that Genoa site was right along Grand River. Uh, and it, my only response was it didn't fit the zoning ordinance. Uh, they wanted something very high, 80 feet, and there's no zoning ordinance. There was one. Howell Township did have zoning that allowed for height that high, but they didn't have the size of the site that capital would have needed. So it's simply about what the zoning ordinance allows, and that was what I had shared with the company. Okay, and so no none of the townships were willing to uh, move their height restrictions. It was that the biggest problem besides the, that was the, first the, the problem. people who uh, uh, don't like development in their right. backyard. If this was really just a textbook review, uh, you know, certainly uh, I think the company was in talks with any of the governments that they thought they could be uh, have a viable project before they even it even got to me. So I just did a textbook review. And then, then what was nice was we our site database is both Livingston and Washtenaw. So I was able to take them and do a few properties in Ipsy Township where the zoning ordinance would work. So I was able to expand my scope of site up availability for that company. Do we know where they landed? I do not. Okay. Uh, Handy Township. Um, uh, Tell me a little bit about Handy Township, because I know that uh, the village of Fowlerville is very open to development. It's Handy Township. I know that uh, they're kind of reticent to develop. At least that, that's my right. feeling. Um, so, because uh, I, I know Handy has a lot of, a lot of area, so and Handy I'm favorable to it. But, yeah. <laughs> so I'll do whatever I can to help. So. Andy Township has been a very open-minded community and it's been great working with them. And so Handy Township has a 180 acre site that actually the township owns. Uh, and it's been a burden on them related to back taxes and the REUs that they continue to pay for. Making sure, and that site was already zoned industrial. They just, they had no idea what the utilities were. They knew nothing about the property other than it was, it was supposed to be a neighborhood before, um, before the recession back in 08. Uh, so we were able to put some grant funds together and do an engineering report. Uh, so now we've got a very comprehensive, we know where the, um, the county drain lands. We know how much of a percentage of the property is wetlands. We know where the utilities land. We know, we know all this basic information that now we can actually promote. Uh, and so actually we're working at the township to see if they would want to broker the site. Do they wanna have a professional broker represent the site or not? Uh, and I think that in the next few weeks, they'll make that decision. But they've been very open-minded. Uh, you know, a power plant wanted to go in Handy Township about five years ago, and they were very open-minded about that as well. So I don't think they're closed off on development, but it's going to be the right development. And I like working with their planning team too. One, one last request. Keep Gregory Road Interchange in the back of your mind. I talked about that with Ed today. It is in the back of my mind. That's good. <laughs> That's the, in, we have 20, some in 20 years, there. that'll be very necessary. <laughs> yes, it will. Before. Just like D19 is right now with the proposed um, Motorsports Gateway Project. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else? I have one question. Um, in your, uh, Ms. Gaborowski, in your presentation, mm -hmm. you, meant, you um, cited 12.5 million in new investment commitments. Um, 
can you discuss what um, how that varies from new in investments? I mean, what what is a new investment commitment? So a new investment is that the the, pro, um, the the company has they're either expanding their building or they're bringing in a new line of equipment, meaning that they have to bring in new types of talent. So, for instance, Export Corporation back in February uh, built, I believe it was an eight and a half million dollar um, warehouse along US 23 to expand their and keep their building campus in Livingston County. So that was something that we assisted with them on. And so that was net new investment that they had made into the county with some of the resources that we provided and in working with Green Oak Township. Okay. So, and then Pop Daddy, that referral of the grant was net new, bringing that investment into the county and then the creation of the jobs as a result of that investment. Is that 12.5 million? Um, can I, would I be correct in saying that's uh, new property value that's new, generates new property tax income for the county or? If it's real, yes, I, I, yeah, well, yeah, because personal property, I guess, would also bring in new tax revenue. So yes, if, if it's real or personal, yes, that investment represents real and or personal property investment. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, no more questions. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, item number 11, we'll move to resolutions for consideration. The uh, first um, resolution is 2022-10-157. It's a res resolution authorizing the chair of the Livingston County Board of Commissioners to sign a letter of understanding regarding reclassification and increased higher wage for operation supervisor. Is there a motion? So move, Helzerman. Support, Gross. Motion by Commissioner Helzerman, support by Commissioner Gross. This was reviewed in committee, but... Um, and our um, 911 director is here. Are there any follow up questions from any commissioners? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Resolution passes. Thank you. Thanks. Don't be so talkative next time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, 2022-10-158 is a resolution authorizing specialty courts and programs to apply for the state opioid response to project grant for adult drug court for fiscal year 2023. Is there a motion? So moved, Plank. Support, Griffith. Motion by Commissioner Plank, support by Commissioner Griffith. Um, this was in, reviewed in committee. Are there follow-up questions? by commissioners. Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The resolution passes. Um, next one is 2022-10-159. Um, this is a resolution authorizing specialty courts and programs to accept the state court administrative office grants. Is there a motion? Gross. This was also reviewed in committee, but I'll ask, is there any follow-up questions on this grant? Um, oh, uh, Commissioner Gross. Um, I just would like to point out that in uh, Ms. Applegate's uh, memorandum to us, there was a um, uh, typo. Uh, the paragraph down underneath the chart of, uh, of the revenue, uh, there's a sentence in bold that says no county match is required for any of these programs and new positions are being requested. Um, there should be the word no in there. So there will not be any uh, new positions as a result of this uh, resolution. Thank you. Anybody else? All those in favor signify by saying aye. It's a roll call. Uh, aye. Oh, sorry. This yep. It's a roll call vote. Commissioner Reeder. Yes. Commissioner Nakagiri. Yes. Commissioner Helzerman. Yes. Commissioner Drick. Yes. Commissioner Zajac is absent. Commissioner Griffith. Yes. Commissioner Gross. Yes. 
Commissioner Plank? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Um, next one is 2022-10-160. It's a resolution authorizing the specialty courts and programs to accept the community corrections grant award for fiscal year 2023. Is there a motion? So moved, Reader. Support, Plank. Motion by Commissioner Reader, support by Commissioner Plank. Are there any um, questions or follow up on this grant? Seeing none, uh, roll call. Commissioner Reader. Yes. Commissioner Nakagiri. Yes. Commissioner Helzerman. Yes. Commissioner Drick. Yes. Commissioner Zajac is absent. Commissioner Griffith. Yes. Commissioner Gross. Yes. Commissioner Plank. Yes. Commissioner Smith. Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Uh, next one is 2022-10-161. It's a resolution to approve and implement the results of the MGT of America Consulting LLC classification and compensation study effective 1-1-2023 1 1 for non-union employees. Is there a motion? Motion so, Smith. Support Helzerman. Motion by Commissioner Smith, support by Commissioner Helzerman. Um, I see we have our HR director. Um, handle any questions and I think we also have our consultant with us too correct correct uh, Rick Labib Wood and Rachel King are online actually and available to um, give the presentation to the um, to the commissioners tonight okay if you can pull that up Rick, are you unmuted? Sounds like he's muted. We cannot see the presentation on Zoom, just FYI. I believe I'm I believe now I'm un unmuted. Great, we can hear you. Are we doing the presentation at this moment? I lost them. Give me just one second to get them connected. Am I gone? <clears throat> um, hello, I'm not. Uh... Just one second, we're having. Oh, okay. I just couldn't hear anything all of a sudden. Oh, you're fine. I'm sorry. Just one second, please. Can you can you email it to Krista just to ensure she has that? She does have it. Okay, very good. I'm actually checking right now to see if I have it. Give me just one second, please. Okay.
were there, uh, while we're trying to get the technical difficulties, were there, and, um, you know, this was reviewed in committee, were there questions, specific questions that anybody had right now from commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Gross. Um, no specific question at this point, however, um, there's been some communication in the last few days from uh, several departments, uh, areas of county government, uh, uh, highlighting concerns regarding classifications from certain employees. And um, I have not had the chance to delve into that, but I've had a brief conversation with um, <coughs> Administrator Bird. Um, Commissioner Gross, can you please speak into the mic a little bit louder, please? Can you speak into the microphone? Oh, so okay. Can... Um, I had been considering possibly asking to table this resolution. I'm not doing that at this point, certainly, but um, it strikes me that uh, there's several departments um, that appear to um, see classification changes that um, are bothersome, I guess is probably the right word. Um, I understand that everybody uh, amongst our, our non-union employee group will get an increase out of this, um, but apparently there's some concern about some of the grades. Um, and I was thinking that perhaps we need to take a step back and, and review those situations and see if there wasn't some sort of a, a compromise situation that could be arrived at. Um, but having said that, I also recognize that, that this thing is a, is a little time sensitive with respect to our being able to put together a budget for next year and, and fiscal services having the opportunity to put, put the uh, changes and, and human resources as well, put the changes into to play for uh, starting as soon as practical, uh, hopefully before uh, January 1st. But um, the one concern I have is the, the group of people who, for whom there is a concern are valued people. And, um, and I would hate that the groups, uh, the departments would find themselves losing talented people over uh, what perhaps could be you know, felt as inequity from the wage study. And uh, I recognize that a part of the resolution, there's indicated that it's a, an appeal process could be established, uh, but that would be after six months. And uh, so I have a concern that we might lose some people during that interim. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that uh, after we've approved this, if the department heads... Uh, uh, and or elected officials that are whose departments are impacted by this wage study that that uh, we can work work out solutions to the concerns and uh, uh, if if any members of this board can be helpful I for one would be willing to participate in any discussion because uh, I think we we need to get this done. So I just wanted to let everybody know that I, I had those concerns um, and I'm not going to proceed with trying to table this at, at this point. Thank you, Commissioner Gross. Anybody, uh, when we're, whenever we're ready for the slideshow, I'll just um, cut me off, but I'll, until you cut me off, I'm gonna ask if there's any other questions from commissioners. Commissioner Drick. I may have spotted an internal inconsistency may have. In the first, be it resolved, it takes effect January 1, 2023. In the fourth, be it resolved, on the second page, a part of this appears to be immediately effective. Was that the intent? Or should we amend the immediately effective to the same date as January 1, 2023? The effective date is intended to consistently be 1-1-2023. So it would be okay to change the, to amend the fourth, be it resolved on page two, to get rid of the word immediately and add a date. 
I see. Yes. I would make that a motion to amend the fourth, be it resolved, to remove the word immediately and put in the date of January, effective January 1, 2023. Support. So we have a motion to amend from uh, Commissioner Drick and support from Commissioner Helzerman um, to, to make sure the uh, date is of when it starts with 1 1 of 23. Any uh, discussion, questions from commissioners on the amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. So we now we have an amended motion. Um, are we ready with the show? Isn't it? Okay. Not worse. I'm having a hard time getting it to share properly. I don't know what the problem is. So if you want to bear with me for a few more minutes, I'll try to work with it again. So the um, you know, I've I've seen the presentation, I've read the present presentation, I but you know, I uh, was part of the personnel committee that you know where it was presented. So I don't want to speak for commissioners who were not at the personnel committee meeting. So I'm gonna ask what the pleasure is in terms of moving forward um, this evening. Commissioner Gross. Um, while I'm not a member of the personnel committee, I did attend the meeting last week and I did view the presentation. And for, for my purposes, I think it's okay to proceed without seeing it again. Okay. Anybody else, any concerns for commissioners who had not seen the presentation? All right, so um, I would ask if there's any other questions for our um, HR director or our consultants um, before we vote. C Commissioner Helzerman. Um, yeah, we, as uh, Commissioner uh, Gross said, uh, there, well, anytime you have a change, there's some things that you do not see. Uh, what is the um, uh, process by which we, because some of these things I think uh, in the pros prosecutor's thing was that uh, budgetarily, it might be hard to work these out immediately. They needed to be, they needed, needed more time to, to roll out. Um, what, what are our options to uh, make those changes that are, I think would be agreeable to us? Because at this point, we only have uh, this consultant's input. We don't have the input from the people, the directors who are actually uh, putting this into implementing it actually. Um, so. so the process in terms of how the consultant was able to make a recommendation actually came from the feedback of our employees, from our managers. The draft results did go to all department heads. There was a week long period of feedback that was sought. Some changes were made by MGT as a result of that feedback. And this, uh, this final study results is a result of all those sort of that feedback loop. So we've already had the initial uh, feedback from the directors. Um, and do you think that that's sufficient? Is that your, is that your conclusion? I think that with the appeal process that's part of the system is sufficient because that will give the opportunity to the employees and department heads who have concerns to um, to make a formal request to make the case for you know, based on reasons a b and c they believe it should be done differently um, this may be a question for nathan nathan uh, uh, is uh, our do you see that? Do you see this as a workable that, that these kinks that are coming up right now that they can be worked out uh, either before uh, implementation in January or uh, or through the appeals process? Give it, 
Could I have your your yeah? Answer, I, I your think idea that, about this. I mean, there's there's avenues to work concerns out. Um, the appeals process is part of it. We also have a personnel committee meeting every month where we can talk about reclassifications. If there's requests that people feel just cannot wait, somebody could craft a, a, a resolution for personnel um, to, to sort of bypass the six month waiting process if they want. I do wanna be really cautious though, is that um, not everybody's gonna be happy with this. <laughs> if you have a study like this that everybody's happy, then something weird has happened. Um, I mean, this is the, just the bottom line is, you know, we, we hire a consultant for a reason to give us empirical data and to also consider our internal issues. But I think we could talk about this for a year and there's going to be some some issues with the final product. But I do think the appeals process, as well as the normal uh, personnel committee uh, process, does give us an opportunity to deal with those legitimate issues that may exist um, after implementation. Could you characterize uh, things that have come to you that we uh, concerns of losing uh, employees? Uh, the, the way the workplace is right now, um, that's a concern everywhere. We're adding $1.1 million onto our non-union payroll. To me, it would be odd to say I'll stay without the collective 1.1 million added, but I'm, I'm going to get a bonus and still leave now because I don't like the study. I, I find that hard to believe personally. Um, but we will lose people over the next six months because that's just the nature of work right now. There, there will be people who will come and go. We do exit interviews with them. Sometimes they say it's pay. Sometimes they say it's other things. And so I, I don't know that a positive study like this is going to send people to the doors. If it does, they'll write research papers about this probably uh, in the future. And I don't mean to diminish, to, to diminish the concerns because there are concerns and there's always going to be things to work through. But to answer your initial question, I think we have avenues to work through those. Um, and then ultimately, if it goes, you know, if somebody utilizes personnel, the board will be deciding what's appropriate. Um, and the appeals process will be in coordination with HR and uh, our consultant as well. So I think there's a couple avenues to work on things. That's good. I'm happy. Commissioner Gross. No, none of the other commissioners got a question. This will be the second time around for me. Anybody else for the first time? Commissioner Gross. Um, as we go through the process of implementing this plan, um, I'm assuming that our directors or supervisors at some time will have a one-on-one -on -one with each employee to explain what they're gonna get as a result of the study. Would that be accurate? They can, they can do that. HR will be putting out individualized letters to employees, um, as well as MGT will be uh, providing three different, uh, well, one manager meeting and two employee meetings to describe the nature, uh, hopefully, Zoom screen sharing works uh, for them. <laughs> but those will be um, forthcoming in the next few weeks. So, and there's other opportunities as well for those individual discussions, but those are the communications expected from HR. I, I guess my overriding concern would be that we need to make sure that all of our employees fully understand the appeal process. Mm -hmm. um, make sure that they're given whatever information they need that lays it all out. Um, I would hate to have somebody come back seven months from now and Let's see, I don't like this, and they missed the boat somehow. Um, like County Administrator Bird said, there is that reclass process that's always available. Okay. So there would be that. They wouldn't get stuck in the loophole. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, seeing no more questions, uh, this one also requires a roll call vote. Commissioner Smith. Yes. Commissioner Reeder? Yes. Commissioner Nakagiri? Yes. Commissioner Helzerman? Yes. Commissioner Drick? Yes. Commissioner Zajac is absent. Commissioner Griffith? Yes. Commissioner Gross? Yes. Commissioner Plank? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. 2022-10-162, uh, the resolution approving an appointment to the Livingston County Aeronautical Facilities Board. Is there a motion? So moved, Helzerman. Motion by Commissioner Halzerman, support by Commissioner Griffith. Any questions, discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The resolution passes. Um, 
2022-10-163 is a resolution approving appointments to the Livingston County Foundation Board of Directors. Is there a motion? So moved, Plank. Support Smith. Motion by Commissioner Plank, support by Commissioner Smith. Any questions or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The resolution passes. 2022-10-164 um, is a resolution approving appointments to the Livingston County Human Services Collaborative Body. Is there a motion? So move, Plank. Support, Smith. Motion by Commissioner Plank, support by Commissioner Smith. Is any discussion? Commissioner Plank. Um, I'd like to make an amendment uh, um, to this resolution to add Stacy Farrell back into um, to be considered on the board or on the committee. The um, motion to uh, for your amendment, the, the resolution was defeated in personnel committee. The appropriate thing to do if you want to readdress the issue would be to um, make a motion to reconsider in personnel before it comes to the full board. Even if we had two thirds vote to support it? Um, it was defeated. The, the appropriate thing would be to reconsider it in personnel. Point of order, Mr. Chair, if there's a, if there's a motion to amend, why isn't there a call to support regardless of what the motion to amend is? Because it was defeated in personnel it, the appropriate thing to do would be to bring it up again in personnel. I, you know, I, I, uh, if, if the majority of the board disagrees with me, we can um, do it otherwise, but that is the appropriate way to do it. I, I support the, uh, the amendment. I just don't know that we've... <laughs> Okay, I support the amendment. If so, the uh, I'm ruling the amendment out of order. So you can support it, but it's an out of order amendment. Should we ask our legal counsel on this? This is the first I've seen, and I I've only been on the board for eighteen months, but uh, it's the first I've seen this. The this isn't a legal question, it's a parliamentary question. Uh, does not the board have the ability to, is it two thirds to overrule the, the chair's? Yes, the chair's uh, decision. Yes, so do we want to do discussion since we now have support and then figure that out? The appropriate thing to do would be to um, query, to vote on whether you would like to overrule the ruling, the parliamentary ruling of the chair. Okay. Is there um, a motion to do that? So moved, Plank. Support, Smith. There's a motion uh, with support. Um, any discussion? All those in Mr. favor chair. of overruling the chair signify by saying aye. 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 Um, I thought I heard three, is that correct? Four that Four. I can hear. Four, okay. Um, all those opposed, um, same sign, aye. aye. Don't you need two thirds? Yes. Overruled. So, yeah. Mr. can you guys hear me? Yes. Your board rules for appeal from the decision of the chair indicate that a majority vote of the members present um, is necessary to overrule the decision. It does say the check chairperson shall not preside over such vote. I don't see any real concern with that. But my understanding at this point, based on the call of the chair, we have a four to four. Is that correct? Perhaps you want to take a showing of hands or a roll call, chair. Was it four to four? Carol, did you vote no? No, I voted to overrule. Oh, did and so did Carol. So did all of us. So it's four of us. Sorry. So it's five to three. Commissioners, we can't hear anything on Zoom. Yeah, let's. 
Um, let me do a roll call. Commissioner Smith. Yes. Commissioner Reader. Yes. Commissioner Nakagiri. No. Commissioner Helderman. No. Commissioner Drift. No. Commissioner Griffith. Yes. Commissioner Grove. Yes. Commissioner Flint. Yes. So we will um, uh, consider the motion to amend and add um, Ms. Farrell. Is there any discussion on the amendment? Yes, please. Commissioner Drick. Looking at the resolution, do we add another term expiring? Do we throw somebody off? Where, where do we fit her in? How does it work? In the previous resolution that was um, considered last week, there was a, another category of new where Ms. Farrell was uh, located and also uh, Ms. Creech. So that, so that whole section of new has, has been taken out, would need to be put yeah. back in. Right. But My there are two separate uh, ex expiration dates. I don't think they have the same expiration date. Okay, so we'll amend it to add um, under new Stacy Farrell for county resident term expires 930 2025. Madam Clerk, you have that? Okay. I um, would like to uh, uh, ask for a five minute break. I have to find some notes that I uh, was not ready to discuss this, but uh, I have some notes in my uh, phone here somewhere. So we'll call a recess till uh, on my computer, well, at 20 after on the big clock.
The um, so we're discussing a amendment to add uh, Miss Farrell onto the um, nominations for the um, uh, human uh, human services collaborative body. It was a motion made by Commissioner Plank, supported by Commissioner Smith. Uh, we'll let uh, Commissioner Plank um, go if she wants the first discussion. Well. I'll start out by saying that um, after our vote last Monday in personnel, I received a call from Ms. Farrell. She was trying to understand, you know, why we voted the way we did. And, you know, she shared with me her passion, much like she did today, about being on that committee and what it means to her um, and to her family to be a part of that and to help others um, who may go through the same struggles that she's been through. Um, you know, and I was a yes vote, by the way, and um, but she knew that. So I asked her to reach out to Commissioner Smith of Zajac and Helzerman um, to help understand, I can't speak on their behalf, and to help understand why they voted no, which I believe she did. Commissioner Smith um, uh, had uh, spoken with her as well, but I'm not gonna talk about that because that wasn't my conversation. Um, and I also believe she talked to Commissioner Helderman, um, but I don't know if she ever was able to get in touch with um, Commissioner Zajac. Um, so I thought it was pretty impressive that she's very passionate about being on this committee, that she was reaching out to every one of us to help us to help her understand what was the roadblock um, in getting on this committee. Um, and then, uh, then after learning that Commissioner Drick's wife recognized her as a community leader, you know, I thought, wow, that that's a pretty impressive too. And um, so, of course, that uh, made me feel even better about my yes vote um, when we had that conversation. Um, I know prior to the personnel meeting, uh, Commissioner Nakagiri sent out an email to all the commissioners regarding his concern about the two appointments on that resolution um, last week. And he was concerned that Ms. Farrell is an advocate for transgenderism for young children. Um, but after speaking to Ms. Farrell and listening to her speak to call the public, I think Commissioner Nakagiri mischaracterized her. I also would hope that Commissioner uh, Nakagiri um, would um, reconsider um, his, his, what he's thinking about um, what she stands for um, as it relates to that type of um, that area, I guess, and um, uh, and give her a chance or, and, and, and allow us to um, appoint her as a voluntary committee for the human services collaborative body. And, and I think about just even the title, collaborative is a key word in that whole title. There's different perspectives from different people. Uh, different walks of life, different experiences, and we have to have those on our committees to be the most effective committee you can be. We can't have a bunch of people with the same exact perspective on a committee because we would get nowhere. So for me, I'm totally in support of um, having her as a part of that committee. Thank you. Any other commissioners wishing to speak to the amendment? I'll, I'll go as the person speaking. Let I um, am strongly uh, opposed to anybody, not just Ms. Farrell, that um, thinks it's in any way, shape, or form acceptable to be promoting transgender, transgenderism to four to eight-year-old children. I think that is um, appalling that um, uh, to have anybody with that point of view anywhere close to making public policy decisions on behalf of a conservative county. It is not just um, uh, Ms. Farrell's statements that call the public were not the only instance of her support of this uh, public reading of I Am Jazz. The, I did a uh, Google search uh, and saw her support um, in other areas, specifically in the Livingston Post. Um, and then I did a little bit more um, uh, looking into Ms. Farrell's point of view um, on a variety of issues. I found out she has uh, been a guest columnist for the 
Livingston Post, a known left-wing uh, publication seven times in about the last year on a variety of subjects. I read them all. I, am, uh, I don't think they comport with the vast majority of Livingston County citizens. Um, in addition to her own postings on um, a variety of subjects, uh, she was um, interviewed and quoted in, uh, on July 15th of 2021 in a public meeting. Uh, this was reported by John King of WHMI, July 15th, 2021, in an article titled Public Meeting Again Consumed by Drag Queen Bingo Controversy. In that, um, the, uh, uh, I I'll read the entire sixth paragraph because it provides better context than just the, in my view, the offending statement. Um, it says, it said in the sixth paragraph, um, despite that, uh, many of those who spoke against, this is regarding drag queen bingo, who spoke against the event were explicit in their opposition to the LGBTQ lifestyle, referring to it as sinful and, and equating drag queens with being pedophiles. In response, Stacy Farrell of Osceola Township said, it only took seconds on the internet for her to find dozens of pedophiles already living in the air, area and that it was a quote, ter terrible stereotype to automatically place men in drag, to automatically place on men in drag. Quote, imagine if they were here right now, would you actually say that to their face, end quote. A woman in the audience immediately yelled out, um, quote, how do you know that they are not? To which uh, Farrell described, how do you, quote, how do you know they are? At this point, the HAPRA board chair, Sean Dunlevy, reminded the audience to please be respectful and not interrupt those speaking. Farrell then concluded by saying it was, quote, discriminatory and stereotypical, and that is what it, people expect out of Howell. I, I think that's a more appalling statement than anything she said with regards to the, um, the uh, trans transgenderism to um, say that everybody in Howell is discriminatory and stereotypical. I, I don't want somebody representing Livingston County um, with that um, point of view. I, I think it is um, perpetuates the myth uh, around Livingston County. It is not uh, appropriate for a representative of Livingston County to spout those um, views. Last thing that I wanna mention is um, I took the opportunity to um, observe in public records that in 2020, uh, Ms. Farrell, um, uh, requested a Democrat ballot in the presidential primary. One of 16 or 17 percent of people that chose to do that. Now, I am um, not opposed to Ms. Farrell. I'm opposed to her public policy point of view, and that uh, it represents, in my view, an extreme minority in the county. Somebody that is um, as it was stated earlier tonight, um, persons that vote in presidential primaries are not casual voters. They don't have uh, middle of the road views. They have conservative views. They have liberal views. We have somebody that has um, very liberal views pointed out by her writings in the Livingston Post, um, pointed out by her quotation by WHMI, um, I, I'm just troubled that we are even considering somebody who doesn't have the, um, I'll say, mainstream values that are represented here in, in conservative Livingston County. That's all I have to say. Anybody else? Commissioner Griffith. Um, I served on the Human Services Collaborative Board in the past, and um, I, I would tell you that I, aside from it, I haven't really looked up any of the 
uh, individuals that sit on the board, anything that they have said or published or whatever. But I would like to say from my experience from being selected to be on that board in the past, I have found that it was an effective way for um, different nonprofits and organizations in Livingston County to work effectively and efficiently um, to do the best for the community good. So for instance, on that board, uh, we had members from community mental health, transportation, which was LETS, um, Catholic services, work skills, um, Judicial Services, United Way. I saw them all coming together to try to resolve issues um, faster as a group um, than everyone kind of having, um, I guess I would say, um, trying to champion all of their individual wants or needs. Um, so I didn't see this board as being one that actually looked at individual people's personalities that sat on the board, but those that came together that had real issues that could help um, the community meet the needs a little bit faster. And not only that, um, you know, I was really pleased that the county commissioners in 1995 endorsed this board and it's been the envy of other communities because Livingston County has been able to work collectively, effectively and efficiently. So I guess I was looking at this particular body um, a little bit differently than and you have had, I don't know who serves on that board now. What commissioner serves on your meeting? So I don't know if you've seen uh, individuals. I'm just saying when I was on the board, I, I thought it was pretty effective. I really enjoyed being on that board because everybody did really work together. So thank you for your service. Anybody else? Commissioner Gross. As Commissioner Griffith has just, uh, discussed regarding the membership of the HSCB. Uh, I'm proud to have been a member for the last year and a half, I think. And uh, while I have not been able to attend all of their meetings, that they've been Zoom and I've had some conflicts, um, from time, you know, I shouldn't say time to time, rarely has there been anybody who has uh, been on the agenda and spoken of a particular activity um, that has been profoundly liberal uh, or profoundly um, supportive of um, the LGBTQ lifestyle uh, or profoundly supportive of CRT or DEI. Uh, there have been times when those um, topics have been mentioned, but in my experience, being a member of that group um, does not enable a given person to dictate any part of the agenda or, or any decisions that the board makes. There's, there's multiple there's probably 20 people, 25 people all together on the board. And I personally think that from time to time, it's good to hear other um, information. Um, I may not agree with it. Um, others may not agree with it, but uh, it, it's information which is beneficial. So um, I, uh, I understand the chairman's concerns about Ms. Farrell, but I, I reluctantly, uh, I, I don't agree with that. And I would continue to support Ms. Farrell for this position. Commissioner Smith. Yeah, I just uh, wanna follow up. Um, I did have a chance to uh, talk to Ms. Farrell after uh, the initial vote and uh, actually had a very good conversation with her. Uh, this is a person who's who is dedicated to serve others and something so desperately needed in the world today and the fact that she wants to be part of the collaborative body uh which which really focuses on uh the gaps and and she's been through the trenches on the gaps uh, i uh told her at the end of our conversation that i would reach out to people i know because i wanted to get personal references 
and I did that. And I got four personal references and two of them uh, are members of that committee, two are not. And each person was adamant about what a tremendous asset she would be. Uh, so uh, my position remains that um, I, I think Stacy Farrell ought to be a part of that uh, collaborative body. Commissioner Hauserman. Uh, I also had a very, I thought, prof profitable discussion with uh, 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 Ms. Farrell, Stacy. Um, and, you know, I'm, I am torn with this. I, the, the, the question, uh, uh, this is a collaborative body, uh, first of all, uh, and it is one of the best expressions of Livingston County, I think. There, as I have seen her in, in uh, the call to the public previously, I see her as a strong advocate. I think that um, you know, I, at this point, I'm not prepared to vote for her at this time. I think that when we're considering these things, um, uh, it seems to me that uh, at least her when she came to us, the, the demeanor that she had uh, was not, I didn't picture as collaborative. Um, every, uh, there may be people that are, uh, there's no question that Stacy is very committed to this. Uh, there's no, there is no question uh, that she is already working uh, with uh, one of the committees on uh, the collaborative board. It is very positive in that way. I think that there are certain things that are disqualifiers. No matter how well the person is fitted for the job. Um, uh, for example, if we were looking for an architect and we found out that the architect was a member, not maybe a member, but uh, held racist views and said them in public. There are certain, certain views that I think are disqualifying for, in, in, my, in my personal opinion, because this is, this is a personal opinion. It's not, uh, it, it's, yeah, because uh, there are certain things that I think, uh, in my mind, disqualify a person for a job like this. Uh, and I think that um, it is my judgment that I, that she shouldn't be on this uh, on this committee. Although, like I said, we had a very fine conversation, uh, and I applaud the work that she's doing on the committee and and where she's working right now. Um, and one of twenty five is not going to be too dangerous. However, I, I I I can't come to thinking that I should vote for her. Commissioner Reeder. As usual, I come to this at a different view, having been a judge and having supported the rule of law. Different points of view in this country are our foundation. And if we try to quash them, we are making democracy start with a small d. Different points of view are fundamental to our constitution. And I may not agree with a lot of people, and a lot of people may not agree with me. 
but I will fight for anyone to be able to express that point of view, no matter what it is. And in a collaborative body such as this, we should be welcoming differences of opinion so that in the end, we can serve this community and the agencies that are represented there by having different points of view and to reach what is right for us. Ms. Farrell is committed to the HSCB's mission, which basically says, ensuring a system of support for members of our community. I do not see how she goes against that. And for those reasons, I think she qualifies to be on this board and it doesn't really matter what her points of view are other than the fact that she needs to be able to express them. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, I'll, I'll go for a second time before uh, we terminate the debate. Um, yeah, I, I'm open to various points of view, um, but I, as I've spoken earlier, you know, um, there are some points of view that are out of bounds. Uh, racism would be out of bounds. Um, um, if you, if one supported Nazism, that would be out of bounds. For me, um, this uh, promotion of transgenderism to four to eight year old children is, is out of bounds. Our society is under attack from these, um, I'll call it uh, um, ideologues that believe that it's okay to be telling children, uh, promoting to children, um, you can change your gender at 48. Now, if somebody wants to change their gender as an adult, have at it that you you are an adult you can make your own decisions but pushing this uh propaganda onto children is for me i'm not, uh, just not going to go there we i am not going to approve of anybody um into any public policy making position that views that as okay now um Ms. Farrell or anybody else that wants to volunteer um, and assist the HSCB as a volunteer, a non-voting member, a non-policy-making member, that's fine with me. But I am not going to uh, ever vote to appoint somebody that um, sees that uh, promotion of transgenderism to young children as acceptable. Are there any other discussion? Commissioner Gross. There's one other, one other comment I'd like to make. Um, it was brought to our attention how Ms. Farrell voted. And if a person's voting record is, is some sort of a litmus test for, for an appointment, then I, I think we should be doing it for everybody that's on this list. And I don't feel that that is correct. I think how a person votes is sacred. That's why we have voting booths. And that's why when we have absentee ballots, we, we fill them out, we put them in an envelope and we seal it and we send it in so that the proper people, um, presumably the proper people will open that and tabulate our vote. Our vote is sacred as part of our Declaration of Independence, our Constitution. And I don't, I will never, never understand how we can judge a person for anything by the way they voted, which should have been in secret. So I, I discount the comments that were made with respect to Ms. Farrell. Anybody else? Roll call vote, please. Commissioner Klein. Yes. Commissioner Smith. Yes. Commissioner Reader. Yes. Commissioner Nakagiri. No. Commissioner Helsman. No. Commissioner Drick. No. Commissioner Sajak Jackson. Commissioner Burgess. Yes. Commissioner Gross. Yes. Motion carried. 
So we have a amended um, motion adding Ms. Farrell onto the list of um, uh, nominations for the board to um, approve. Is there any further, is there any discussion on the amended motion? Roll call vote, please. Commissioner Plank. Yes. Commissioner Smith. Yes. Commissioner Reader. Yes. Commissioner Nakagiri. No. Commissioner Drake. No. Commissioner Helsman. Uh, no. Commissioner Zajac is absent. Commissioner Griffith. Yes. Commissioner Gross. Yes. Motion carries. The uh, next up on the agenda. Hold on a second. I got my pages. Uh, is 2022-10-165. It's a resolution establishing compensation for the Livingston County Board of Commissioners. Is there a motion? So moved, Mike. Board Reader. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The resolution passes. Um, item number 12 is accounts payables. We have claims dated October 24th, 2022, and payables dated October 1st through October 14th, 2022. Looking for a motion to approve the claims and payables. Motion to approve, Griffith. Support Gross. Uh, motion by Commissioner Griffith, support by Commissioner Gross. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. I oppose same sign, the bills are paid. Item number 13 is our last call of the public. Um, anybody wishing to address the board has uh, two minutes. Um, we'll start, hold on, I'm gonna get my timer here. We'll start in the uh, room here. Is there any? Stacy Farrell. Pretty impressive. I had to have my son leave the room because I was afraid what you were going to say. To, to say that I promote transgender, that's a boy. I have three daughters and one son. They were born that way. And that's how they identify. Not every child feels that way. I don't promote transgenderism. I promote the affirmation of kids. Whatever kids need to feel in order to feel accepted, that's what I do. The comment in WHMI, if you reread it, because words matter, is by calling a drag person a pedophile is, is, is stereotypical. That is what people expect. I have done nothing but try and change the perception of this county. I love living in Howell. And what I was told when I first moved here about what kind of place this is, it is not, Howell is not what these terrible rumors are. I love this community. And when we talk about what my position, just so you feel comfortable and whoever else with my voting record, um, I, that was my first democratic ballot. The first time that I ever voted Democrat in an election, actually the presidential election of 2016 but because i didn't feel comfortable about it and it's for sharing information i voted republican every other race just because i wasn't comfortable with donald trump is that okay am i allowed to do that are you okay with me voting for and you want to know why i voted for hillary and there was only one reason because i believe there's one redeeming quality in everybody it's because she's the one who instituted the children's special health care program the program that saved my son Seconds. In my last 15 seconds, I'm going to invite you to do the math for what 126 vote is. It's less than 0.3%. And what did you say? There's like 16% Democrats. At least I'll be able to have 0.3% influence and represent 0.3% of the people in this county. I will do a good job. I won't spend my time focusing on whatever it is, you have my phone number. You can call me. If you want to talk about this stuff, I'm more than happy to talk about it. But to accuse me of promoting something to four to eight-year-olds, I didn't read that book. And that book wasn't read to kids. 
it was an online thing. It wasn't even my project for crying out loud. And you're holding this against me. I, I can't like, I am, I'm mortified right now that this is what you think of me. And I came before this board four other times. What was my demeanor then? How many times have I tried to contact the people in this room? What was my demeanor then? I feel like you need me to tell you, like, if you smile, Stacy, you'll be prettier. I mean, like, I'm not sure what's what what you're expecting from me and my demeanor. I'm angry. You sent out an email ahead of time saying that I promote transgenderism. It is untrue. I support kids, all kids, all kinds of kids, no matter how they feel. Thank you. Thank you. The plank. Um, I uh, was going to bring this up at reports, but we kind of moved past that. Um, I had the pleasure of attending for the very first time Brighton um, Schools um, put together a distinguished alumni wall of fame <clears throat> ceremony. And our beloved Kate Lawrence was. Um, an honoree, and it was a pleasure to be there and support her. Um, I, um, it was full of, the room was full of leaders in the community, um, family, friends of the honorees, including um, Dave Llewellyn, who I did not know, graduated from Brighton High School in 75, and uh, Drew Henson. I'm not an F, I don't, watch football or baseball. So, but uh, apparently he uh, was also a Brighton High School um, uh, alumni uh, from 1998. And it was just remarkable to sit through that and watch that. And um, they're going to make it a, every year they're going to be doing this. And so um, anybody who's an alumni, you have an opportunity to get nominated. Um, and if you're not, you might have an opportunity to put forth someone that you feel deserves this. And I uh, was very, very proud of Kate. Thank you. Helzerman. Uh, I'd like to finish my, my comments from, uh, I'll, I'll start in the middle here. Uh, premeditated end of one's life is generally called first degree murder. Hanging a person without a formal trial is called lynching. Uh, conviction without due process is called a kangaroo court. Only the state can legalize the death penalty. Proposal three, in effect, makes the mother both judge and jury in her own case. The person performing the removal of the baby is comparable to the execu executioner. Vocabulary makes a big difference. The word abortion limits the discussion. Considering only the woman's health is also a very narrow approach to the whole picture. Uh, you, uh, your vote depends on which words you hold to be true. Check your vocabulary before you vote. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody on Zoom? Seeing none, I'll look for a, I'll close the call to public and look for a motion to adjourn. So moved, Griffith. Support, Mike. Motion by Commissioner Griffiths, support by Commissioner Plank. All those in favor of adjournment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. We're adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>